All right, what's going on, Grace Church? My name's uh, Pastor Miguel. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace. And um, thank you all for being here on this amazing Mother's Day weekend. Thank you for those of you who are joining us online, wherever you are, wherever you are. Um, uh, happy Mother's Day, moms, or as I would like to say, uh, happy uh, greatest human beings on the planet day. Man, can't say enough. Can't say enough. Uh, I don't know about you, but have you ever had a time where uh, maybe you saw something or, or you had something that uh, you really didn't realize how valuable it was? Um, you really didn't realize it till later. So as a kid, I remember watching a movie. It's a, it's a great American childhood movie called The Sandlot. <laughs> yes, The Sandlot. Yeah, yeah, great movie. But uh, there, there's a scene in The Sandlot where this character, this main character, named, this little boy named uh, Smalls, um, he actually brings a baseball to play with, but has no idea of its true value uh, until afterwards. Take a look at this clip. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in church today. Yes, the great Bambino, come on. And uh, if you've seen this movie before, um, you know that obviously he had no idea the value of this ball. And, um, and it wasn't until he finally realized, when he finally realized how valuable this ball was, his desire for it changed. And, and actually the rest of the boys, so much so that the next scene, they're actually jumping into the backyard of the beast to get it back, right? This massive dog. And so, um, and here's the thing. Here's the whole point of that. When our value for an object increases, our desire for that object, obviously, also increases. So we're in a series today called The Way of Jesus. This is part two. Last week, Dan opened up the series and talked about grace, that being grace-based is the way of Jesus. And today, I want to talk to you about the Bible and why being biblically founded is the way of Jesus. And so I want to read this verse for you. It's in Matthew 7. This is Jesus speaking, and it's found in Matthew 7, verse 24 through 27. Here's what it reads. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall, because it had been, here it is, founded on the rock. Now here's the other part. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and it beat against that house and it fell. And listen, didn't just fall, but it, and great was the fall of it. It was a really serious deal. Now listen. If you're a believer, you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, you've surrendered your life to Jesus, you're a Christ follower, and you're, and, and you're like me, right? Then you believe that this book, or your copy of it, this book is the inspired, inerrant Word of God, and we can therefore trust in it. All right. I didn't have an applause cued right there, but praise the Lord. And, and if you're like me, you believe this, but here's the thing. In just my years of, of following Jesus and going to church and all those things, I have found that many Christians don't actually read the Bible or, or let alone do what it says. And so we treat it like any other book, not realize it's been signed by the Creator. Some of us in this room and those of us who might be watching online, you're just here and you're listening, you're going, listen, I don't really believe the Bible. It's old, it's, it, it's probably not really trustworthy all that much. And you kind of see the Bible, it's just like, okay, maybe there's some good moral principles I can take from it here and there, but actually in the end, I don't really see much value for the Bible. And so again, we treat it like any other book and just kind of toss it aside. We need it every once in a while, it's nice to hear, but that's about it. And again, so we have those who are believers who believe in Jesus. And the only time we really hear the Bible or read the Bible is Sunday at Grace. And then there's others who just don't believe that the Bible is legit, right? It's like, this is, this is just, you know, how can you really trust it? And so here we are. And so if we're going to be biblically founded, then we probably should look just briefly at why the Bible is trustworthy and reliable. 
and we can therefore trust in it. So today, listen, I just want to bring some clarity and answer some questions that have been raised against the Bible. Um, in my experience, some common questions and objections against the Bible. And I just want to kind of bring some thoughts to that in hopes that your value for it and desire for it would increase and it would become more valuable in your life. And my prayer for you is that you would begin to be grounded and founded in his word. And so let me pray for us real quick before we get into this. Lord, give me the ability to speak the truth today. Help me to be accurate. And everyone who's listening today, allow us to receive whatever it is you want us to learn. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen. All right, you ready? All right. It has been reported for about 50 years that the Bible has been the largest seller of all books published in the history of the world. The Bible was written by about 40 men in about 1,600 years, dating from 1,500 B.C. to about 100 A.D. These men wrote as they were moved and inspired by the Holy Spirit, and they wrote down not in human wisdom, but in the wisdom taught by the Holy Spirit. However, again, in my years, I have found that people have had some objections about the Bible. So we're going to get real. We're going to answer some tough questions. So lean in closely. So one of the questions I usually get about the Bible, one of the top questions is, Miguel, listen, how can we trust something that was written so long ago? Like, how? Uh, Another way people have said it is like, you can't know anything that really happened 2,000 years ago. Come on. Well, here's the thing. What people often fail to understand is that the crucial gap, again, according to historians here, the crucial gap is not the gap between the time of the evidence and today. The crucial gap is actually, here's the crucial gap, the crucial gap is between the evidence and the events that are described by that evidence. Okay, so don't, don't lose me here. Lean in a little bit. Let me take the Gospels. Okay, the Gospels are the uh, biographies of Jesus, the first four books in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're called the Gospels, biographies of Jesus. They're written about 35 to 65 years after Jesus, after the events of Jesus. So Mark being the earliest, John being the latest, okay? If the gap between the events and the evidence for those events is short, then how long it's been since those events to the present day is simply irrelevant. Why? Because good evidence doesn't become bad evidence simply because of a lapse of time. Simply because of a lapse of time. So again, what we're trusting in is not 2,000 years ago, but 35 to 65 years as it pertains to the gospel accounts, okay? But again, let me go further because you're like, wait, wait, Miguel, well, hold on a second, Miguel. I got some more questions for you. I get it, and I'm here. we're going to answer it, okay, real quick. Let me go farther. But what about the original documents? Can we trust what we actually have today? right? This is classic question, right? Uh, The original documents, like the actual, they're called autographs, the actual writing down that the disciples and the people who wrote the the scriptures, the actual manuscripts. What about those? Okay. So glad you asked. It's a good question. Okay. Okay. Let me first say what we believe to be the inspired and errant word of God are the original manuscripts. But here's the thing. We don't got them. You're like, oh, oh, there it is. I'm out. No, no, no. Just hold on a second. Hold on. Before you write me off, okay? Hang in there, okay? Before you write me off, here is the thing. We don't need to have the original manuscripts in order to demonstrate their accuracy. Listen, any more than a prosecutor, prosecutor needs a body to prove that a crime has been committed. Inferences can actually be drawn from the evidence at hand and a reasonable conclusion can be argued from biblical principles. So again, lean into the person next to you and say, wake up. Just say, wake up. Wake up. Yeah, wake up. Can you have to listen fast, okay? You ready? You ready? I drank a cup of coffee right before I came out here. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. Here's the thing. Here we go. Prior to the late 1940s, prior to the late 1940s, the oldest version of the Hebrew uh, text that we had was called the Aleppo Codex. Here's a snapshot of it. It was called the Aleppo Codex. It's part of the late 1940s, okay? It was dated AD 945. And as old as that may seem, it was still more than a thousand years removed from the originals 
which the Bibles, the copies of the Bibles, most of them were copied from and passed on. So how could we be sure that the transmission of this text over that thousand year period, that the scribes had not made any mistakes, right? That now appear in our Bible translations. Hey, so glad you asked. So glad you asked. Here's the thing. In the late 1940s, there was an amazing archeological discovery. Real evidence, here you go. Amazing archeological discovery that was made. It was called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Here's a picture of them. You can see them. You can check them out. Over 40,000 fragments were discovered from 500 different books and writings. Of these books, every single book of the Old Testament except Esther was found. But here's the most important thing you have to get. The writings dated in the Dead Sea Scrolls dated from the 3rd century B.C. to the 1st century A.D. Far older than the oldest previous manuscript, namely the Aleppo Codex. Much older. So here's what ends up happening. This is what it provided for us. It allowed us to test it in the late 1940s, to test, to see if in that thousand year period, if there were any kind of issues, if we actually copied it well. Because now we had something to compare to. So if you're a Christian in the late 1940s, you're either really concerned right now, because now your Bible is about to go to the test here for everything, right? Or you're just having confidence in the Lord. You're just, I just trust it's going to be good. I just trust it's going to be good. So here, here's we got. We got it right here. We're able to test. And here's what we found in that thousand year period of transmission. We found a 95% accuracy to the text. Now, hold on. You're like, oh, 5%. I'm done. I'm out. You know, okay. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here's the thing. That 5% was so minute, it has nothing really to do with the overall context of the text. Let me explain again. You're like, okay, okay. Okay. You're holding on to that argument. I get it. I'm so like this too. Okay. Yeah, okay. That 5%. Okay. Let me just give you one. Most of it most of these little minute errors or what's called variances can be explained in what's called an orthographical variant. An orthographical variant. Many of you have probably studied this, so I'm just going to remind you. Okay, for example, um, there's a word called theater or savior. Here's a couple of words. You see that there are two different kinds of spelling, theater and theater. I don't know. I don't know how to say it. Okay. Or savior and savior. Okay. Have you ever noticed these words? Like sometimes they pop up like on our worship screens. You're like, what is that? It's spelled different. Okay. That's weird. Um, here's the thing. That's called orthographical. Okay. All that means is that these spellings are preferred in different geographical locations and times. Both are actually correct, but it would still technically constitute as an error or variant. The scribe, the historian, has to consider that technically is a variant here in the text. Again, if you're still, you're like, okay, I'm still kind of skeptical. Hold on a second. Here's the other thing to consider. What the historian has to also look at is copies of the documents. So if you find any kind of ancient you know, archaeological document or scroll, such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the things you actually have to look at is how many copies of it do we have? Because the more copies you have, the more accuracy you're able to obtain from it of what was originally trying to be said. So let me give you an example. Here's an example. Here are four copies of the same line on the screen. Now, no, I know this is tough. Lean in a little bit. Can you recognize where the error happened? Yeah, if you've had at least the fifth grade, you know, English, you can understand where the error happened. Now, can you still get 100% of the information, at least the bigger picture of what was trying to be said? Yes, you have won $10 million. And if that's you, see me after church. <laughs> but this is important, right? And the more copies we have, again, the more we're better to obtain an, a better accuracy as to what was trying to be said. And this is true not just for the Bible. This is true for any ancient book in history. This is just part of the process of deciding whether something is credible. Right? So for example, Homer's Iliad, written 800 BC, 643 copies. Pretty good. 
Pretty good, right? Some great stories come out of that, right? Okay, here's another one. Caesar Gallic Wars, earliest copy, 8,900, about 10 copies. Not as good, still good enough, right? Okay, Plato, Plato, right? This is great. He's got some good stuff, right? Okay, written 400 BC, earliest copy, 8,900. That's a 1,300-year crucial gap, by the way. Seven copies, seven copies. Now, okay, hold on to your chair. Hold on to your chair, okay. Real quick. New Testament, Old Testament. Here's how many copies we have. Greek New Testament, 5,686 copies of the Greek New Testament and some 10,000 manuscripts of the Old Testament. So listen, after looking at this, just this one little piece right here, if you're going to disregard the Bible, then you've got to disregard every other ancient book in antiquity because it doesn't hold to what this is actually saying in as far as historical textual facts. You, you have to toss the rest of it out. So what we have today is actually an extremely accurate copy of the original documents of the Bible. And some of these minor, smaller variants can be easily explained. But again, if you're like me, you have another question. What about the contradictions? So maybe it was copied right, maybe everything's good. What, doesn't the Bible have contradictions, right? I mean, we've all, that, that's like a on the street kind of question, right? You're just hanging out, you know, at Starbucks and someone comes up to you and you're just like, hey, contradiction in the Bible. Oh, oh no. Okay. Now, usually this kind of criticism is, is targeted at the Gospels because the Gospels are four biographies of Jesus, four accounts to the same event. So it's natural to just go to the Gospels and see contradictions or apparent contradictions. But here's what we have to understand. We have to be able to differentiate between differences and contradictions. Differences and contradictions. Let me give you an example. A contradiction would be something like the Titanic, when the Titanic sank, it broke in half. Well, maybe other witnesses said, well, no, it was intact when it went down, right? Certainly there's a minor contradiction there in, in the story, okay? Um, but a difference would be something like this. If I came home and my wife said, hey, someone came to the front door and had a check from Publishers Clearinghouse saying that we've won a million dollars, and I'm going, awesome, this is great, cool. Well, later that day, let's just say she calls her mom. She says, Mom, a couple guys show up at the door. One was holding a check. One was holding a camera saying I was going to be on television for being the million-dollar winner. That's not a contradiction. That's a difference. It was simply, one was simply more exhaustive than the other, and other just lacked a few incidental details, but not a contradiction. For example, some of you will walk away today and you'll say, Miguel talked about the Bible. Others will say Miguel talked about the Sandlot, the movie, right? Others will say Miguel talked about the way of Jesus. And guess what? All of you would be correct. All of you would be correct, but you have totally different information, right? Totally different experiences, totally different perspectives. So here's what we have to remember with the Gospels. The Gospel accounts, the biographies of Jesus, they don't contradict each other. The Gospels add to each other. They add to each other like four people standing on each corner of an intersection. Each of them are going to view the incident differently, slightly. There's going to be a core to the story, though, but everyone had a very unique perspective and experience. Any mom in the room, if you have multiple kids, understands that if you want to find the truth out with your teenage kids, okay, and every one of them walks in, and you do one-at-a-time interviews, mom, and you go... Tell me what happened on Friday night. And every one of them gave the exact same detail with the same tone, and everything was exactly the same of what they said. Immediately, you would say, collusion. They all got together and orchestrated the story. You're, you're all liars, right? <laughs> Think about it and come back, right? So what you actually want, and in the court of law with multiple eyewitnesses, the same is true. You actually want some variances to the story, but a core is the same. And again, the same is true with the Bible. But let's just say, let me just, let me just I'll give this to you, okay? Let me, let's just say that, for argument's sake, there are some minor, minor contradictions. That doesn't mean that the Gospels are historically unreliable. No more than the fact that eyewitnesses to the Titanic contradicted each other on whether or not it broke in two 
nullifies the fact that the Titanic still actually sank, <laughs> right? So at the end of the day, we're going, but uh, there was still a man named Jesus who died and rose from the dead. So what are you talking about? You know, it's like at the end of the day, there's a, there's a bigger truth here, even if there were some minor contradictions. Okay, so you're sitting here, you're listening to this, you're going, wow, this is so much information. And maybe you're going, okay, the Bible is a historically reliable piece of literature um, in antiquity and history. Uh, and the copies that we have today are trustworthy. Um, but is it the word of God? I mean, come on. Like you could, you could just be an academic and see and study this and go, okay, it's legit. It's historical, credible, cool. But how is it the word of God? How is the Bible the word of God? Is it really? Well, here's the thing. Great question, by the way. You have really good questions today. Um, every major religion has some kind of holy book. So Islam has the Quran. Mormonism has the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, etc. Um, uh, Hindu has the Vedas. Um, Scientology, Scientology has Dianetics. I mean, and, and the list goes on, right? All of these holy books that claim something, right? But... The Bible is the only thing that has never been wrong in the past, and therefore we can trust what it's going to say about the future because, listen, it, it actually claims to be inspired by God, uh, signed by God, right? It's, it's actually that. And so it claims these things, which means, watch, if, if there is a God, which we believe there is, and, and he wrote down, he, he actually inspired men to write, and this is actually his words, right? Uh, if that actually happened, then, then the things that he prophesies in Scripture must come true. If it doesn't, then we know that's actually not the real God, right? I mean, that'd be, a, that'd be a quick one for us to figure out. So, fulfilled prophecy is extremely great evidence on whether or not deciding if something is divinely inspired, okay? When you finally see and realize how fulfilled prophecy looks and what it is, and you've come to that conclusion, you see a supernatural hand, a guiding hand. You sit here and you go, man, this has got to be God or whatever. It's supernatural. Has to be. Okay? And, and, and let me just give you an example, okay? Because when you look at the, the, the mathematical odds, it's just, it's way, it, the impossibilities are all there. So let me give you an example. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 was unearthed in archaeology, okay? So this is not, I'm not making up a book here. There's an actual book that actually describes about the crucifixion of Jesus, okay? Um, and this book uh, in archaeology was unearthed um, a long time before Jesus. But let me just read one verse. It's probably a verse you've heard. Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Okay, you probably have heard that verse, and that chapter is describing something very specific. But here's the thing. Archaeology has unearthed this. We have this document in a place called the Shrine of the Books Museum. You can go there. It's in Jerusalem. Here's a picture of it. I'm not making this up. You can go there and check it out. It was dated back, watch this, a thousand years before Jesus, okay? A thousand years before Jesus. And here's what makes it even more amazing, okay? The idea of crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet, let alone the governing system of the Roman Empire who create, created the capital punishment of crucifixion. So that, listen, like, okay, I'm just giving you one. That's like saying, like, you created the NFL and all the stats Tom Brady would have in the Super Bowl a thousand years ago. Like, a th all of a sudden, there's something in archaeology that got on earth. There's a man, he would throw a ball, pig skins being thrown around. Like, I mean, it would be rubbish to you at the time, but you're like, what? So th this is what I'm, th I'm just giving you one thing here, right? Th and there's so many prophecies, the virgin birth, the birthplace of Jesus, and there's so many other things that go into this. But when you start actually adding it up, you can't explain it naturally, Okay, let me, let me make it a little bit closer to home, okay? When we all grew up, um, uh, most of us, I'm venturing to say most of us, we went to a school that said, man, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Yeah, yeah, he did. 
And the, the world before that understood, you know, the, the, that the earth was, was flat, right? And we all realize it's not. Okay, this is all good. This is, this is fine. Okay. Here's what it says. Watch this. Okay. Isaiah. This is going to freak you out. Some of you are going to be like, what? Okay. Isaiah 40, verse 22. Okay. Again, we've already unearthed it, dated it back. Okay, watch. Okay. Let me just read it. Isaiah 40, 22. Okay. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Okay. The message translation says round ball of earth. Yeah. Okay. So you're not getting it. Okay. <laughs> that was written 800 years before Jesus. It's dated back. Science dated it back 800 years before Jesus and 2,292 years before the world ever knew. It's like, Isaiah, dude, you should have posted that one. Like, why didn't you? That would have been one to say, okay? But you, yeah, I mean, you're just looking at it, you're going, what? Hold on, back up here, because it's messing with my peanut brain, okay? How, how do I figure this out? Here's the thing, there's about 2,500 prophecies in the Bible. About 2,000 have already been fulfilled. I've only listed a couple, too. I can't, we're not, we don't have time for the all 2,000, right, okay? The other 500 have to do with end times or the days still to come, okay? Now listen, the probabilities, put your math hats on for a second, okay? I'm sorry if you don't like math, we just have to figure this out, okay? The probability of one of these prophecies being fulfilled is one in 10, but since they are all independent of one another, mathematicians have already done the math for us. The probability for all 2,000, already happened, already been fulfilled, all 2,000 be fulfilled is one in 10 to the 2,000th power. I don't know what that number is, okay? I, just, I don't get it. It just keeps going on. Okay, and if you don't think that, okay, listen, let me just give you a better perspective, okay? Um, the known electro, the electrons in the known universe that we understand today, that we've discovered today, is 10 to the 79th power. That's how many electrons that, that are recorded in the known universe. 10 to the 79th power. In fact, mathematicians consider anything, any probability, any odd, one in 10 to the 50th power, mathematically impossible. There you go. So at what point do we start to go, supernatural, duh. I don't know what to tell you anymore, but uh, miracle, I know, I know that doesn't exist, but it happened, okay? I don't know. Like, I get it. But you see, at some point you go, okay, Supernatural, miracle, inspired, God breathed, not of humans, right? Like this is beyond human capability. Like at some point you get there. And this is why we say, listen, this is not just historically reliable, it is the Word of God. It is inspired by Him. It had to be. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite the band back out because I always sound better when they're playing behind me, okay? <laughs> so if the band's going to come out, let me, let me read you a story. I, I learned about this story. Um, it's such a good story. Listen in, lean in really closely. Watch this. There was a host who took a man on a tour of Ohio State University. The host pointed at a building called the Wexner Performing Arts Center. He told the man on that tour, that it was America's first postmodern building. He began to describe how the architect felt, listen, that since life had no purpose or meaning, then why should our buildings? So he built it with no purpose or meaning in mind. The host described how there are staircases that lead to nowhere and rooms that had no particular use for them and so on and so forth. He would describe this building. The host then asked the man on the tour, what do you think? The man thought for a moment and then he asked this question. Did he do the same thing with the foundation? You see, like the man noticed on the tour, we cannot ignore the foundation. We cannot ignore the fact that what we decide to be founded on is life altering. It shakes us up at our core. 
What we decide to put our life in and our, and our trust in is paramount. The foundation matters. This is why the way of Jesus is to be biblically founded. Because the one who is not will be like the person who built their house on sand. And when the storms of life come, and they will, when life gets hard, if you've built your house on sand, it will fall. And listen, and great will that fall be. Not just fall, shatter, completely broken. You see, we live in a day and age where there is constant, constant wrecking and brokenness from the inside out. Circumstances in our life overwhelm our souls and it shakes us at our own core, at our foundation. But the only thing that has stood the test of time the only thing that is unshakable, immovable, unstoppable is the Word of God. The very thing you're looking for is the Word of God. So many of us today spent countless monies on self-help, but it is the Word of God that will sustain us through those hard times. The thing that allowed me to get through the times of my father physically abusing me the times that we were poor and we were on welfare and went from apartment to apartment, the times that I had to go through difficulty, the time that I got a phone call that my brother-in-law was hit and crashed and had a car accident and at 28 years old lost his life. In those moments, what is it that I'm going to be grounded and founded in? What is it that I'm going to put my trust in? And the only thing that will sustain me in those times is the Word of God. Nothing else will stand. But l l let me just give you a two-point version real quick of this. Because this entire time I'm talking about the Bible, right? It's legit. Your Bible's legit. But here's the thing. In John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. Don't, don't let me explain that English, okay? Verse 14, chapter 1. And the Word became flesh. I'm not trying to mess with your brain here for a second, but this is big. What that means is the Word of God is not just letters on a page. It is. But it's not just letters on a page. It was completely manifested in the person of Jesus. Jesus is God's communication to mankind. Jesus is our solid rock, our cornerstone, which is why we sing the songs, say, Lord, my hope is built on nothing less, not on my job, not on my finances, not on my things that I have or, or the accolades that I've got, none of those things. It is on Jesus and nothing but Jesus. And it's that rock that will drive me through and get me through in this difficult season that I'm in. And so if you're here today and your foundation's being shaken, if you feel the storms and the floods and when the rains come, what are you going to put your life on? Would you heed the instruction of Jesus and say, the wise man built his house on rock, the foundation of the Word of God. Let's pray.